Hello and welcome to Curator with a Camera. I'm Anthony Cools, Senior Curator at the National Railway Museum, and we're here in Doncaster today at the Danham Gallery, Library and Museum to have a look at Green Arrow, Gresley's masterpiece. By the 1930s, the London North Eastern Railway was changing its motive power quite rapidly. Under the chief mechanical engineer, Nigel Gresley, later Sir Nigel Gresley, he'd already created the uh, A3 Pacifics, the A1 Pacifics, like Flying Scotsman and others. But they needed other engines to work on mixed traffic, on fast goods trains, passenger trains. The A3s and then later the A4s, the streamlined Pacifics, were very much the front runners. But what are the foot soldiers? Well, the result in 1936 was Green Arrow. As a mixed traffic engine, Green Arrow and its sisters could pull both goods and passenger trains with equal ease. Green Arrow came into the National Collection in the 1960s and is the very last survivor of its type. It is the only V2 locomotive in existence today. So what makes it special? What makes it go? Let's have a look at it in some detail. You might say that it looks a little bit like a sawn-off Flying Scotsman. It's bedecked in that wonderful LNER apple green livery, very eye-catching, very similar design traits to the Gresley Pacifics. But it's shorter, it's lighter, and it's a little bit slower, but not much slower. The engine is a 262. That means it has two pony wheels at the front, two carrying wheels, six driving wheels, and then another pony truck, a trailing truck underneath the cab and the firebox. That's really important because this is the basic way that this engine is able to do its job. It carries its weight with a wide firebox at the back end over that pony truck. That takes the weight of that firebox and it has this leading truck which is able to guide it through points and curves in a nice, easy, steady way. But what else have we got? Right up there, the Gresley boiler, so really productive for, and efficient for making steam with that wide firebox. The, the engine's really effective, very, very free steaming. And here, the name Green Arrow, named after a parcel service, the Green Arrow. Like Flying Scotsman, named after the train service, Green Arrow named after quite a prestigious parcels train service. Originally, when the engine was built, it was going to carry a different number, 637, and the nameplate was going to be halfway along, above the middle set of driving wheels, on a false splasher. Of course, the engine doesn't have them, and uh, it, was, it was relocated up here to the side of the smoke box. But the actual real significant feature on Green Arrow that stands out are these cylinders. There are two on the outside and one in the middle underneath the smoke box. So it's a three-cylinder engine, very much like Flying Scotsman. If you watch the Flying Scotsman film, you will see us talk about the conjugated valve gear that Holcroft came into with the, the uh, two-in-one lever. And here is that lever going out underneath through the frames so that the valves on the outside activate the valve on the middle engine down here between the frames. So that's a three-cylinder engine like Flying Scotsman, but what makes this engine very, very different is the three cylinders, the three engines, are actually all together in one piece. It's called a monoblock casting. It's a really significant piece of locomotive technology because it gives you rigidity, it gives you strength, also gives you the slight problem that if you're going to replace one cylinder, you've got to replace all of them. And this is where the V2's Achilles heel was. As time went by, some of the flaws in the casting, the defects in the casting showed up and cracks began to appear. And Green Arrow is very well known now for having cracks in the casting. And there you can see one of them running down, uh, down to the, the, the steam passage there. Gresley locomotives have a very distinctive front end, almost like a house style. So the arrangement here on the smoke box door 
of the dart, the hinges, the handrails, the knob, all that smoke box, call it smoke box furniture, is the same as you find on Flying Scotsman, but then also through the buffer beam, there is an access hatch there to get through to um, the combination lever and the, and the valve gear inside for the middle engine that's fitted in, in, in there. And then down to our buffer beam. And uh, just for people who do ask these questions, um, the red spot there refers to a previous asbestos management regime that we had at the National Row Museum back in the 90s and just uh, accidentally knocking the GoPro against the buffer. It's a beautiful ring there it makes, doesn't it? Now, not encouraging everybody who comes to Doncaster to give that a go, but uh, yeah, nice little bit of sound. Uh, vacuum, brake pipe upstand there, a fitting for the locomotive for its vacuum brakes so that it can be connected to uh, carriages and wagons in front of it and run tender first. But also, let's not forget that this engine had a period of mainline operation uh, from the 1970s through to 2000, 2006, 2007. So it has the flash there, the warning sign, danger overhead live wires, that's certainly not a heritage feature. But also to enable it to be rescued, it has the fitting of an air brake pipe through the loco to allow it not to operate air brakes, but to allow it to be rescued by an air brake fitted uh, locomotive. The coupling on the front with the deflector plate to protect the AWS gear behind it and these burnished guard irons, these just push debris out of the way on the track, but there they are a very distinctive feature on the V2, especially burnished up for display like that and also holding the front of the pipes for the drain cocks coming down from the cylinders. So many little features on this engine that are there to try and make life easier. Here's our, the top end of our cylinder, the monoblock casting, and uh, the uh, filler lid for the sandboxes, the sand being used to drop down, fed under steam pressure, down to the wheels, and the sand blown onto the track, so forced onto the track so that the wheels could grip in, uh, in wet, damp, damp or slippery situations. And then moving along up to these, what are called Wakefield mechanical lubricators, which help oil get pumped for it mechanically into various parts of the loco, enabling it to operate smoothly. Green Arrow last operated in 2008 and uh, is pretty much here in the Danum Museum as a conserved locomotive as it finished its operating spell. So whilst up there it's all really quite nice and shiny with the apple green, you can see there is still a pattern of wear, uh, paints come off, it's a working engine, things have uh, somewhat weathered slightly, yet um, the motion is still beautifully clean, polished. Uh, I always like this little brass cap on the return crank there. It's uh, just, just something that sets off the Valsharts valve gear on the Gresley engines. But then the six foot two driving wheels and the six foot two enabled these engines to run both at speed, but put their power down on the track. But let's have a look. What have you got on a driving wheel? You've got a crank, which is connected to the piston via the connecting rod here. But there's this large lump cast integrally into the driving wheel itself. And that's a balance weight. It enables the engine to run smoothly and it's allowing the thing to be balanced. And there's a large balance weight to counterbalance the forces on the driven axle. That's what they call this because it's got the connecting rod and the coupling rods coming down to it. And then on the rear axle, there is a, a smaller balance weight. Still does the same thing, but not quite so much need to be able to balance the reciprocating forces that are coming through the motion to the driving axle there. One of the great things about these engines is the way that their stories are told by the parts of them. And that's because of the interchangeability. These things were working machinery. They were locomotives that were designed to be repaired. So occasionally something would need repair in the workshop so a piece would be substituted from another engine. 
But with Green Arrow, we can see quite clearly that certainly large numbers of the parts of the, the motion are actually Green Arrow. And uh, these bits certainly are. The leading left coupling rod certainly is. When it was restored in the 1970s by Bill Harvey in Norwich for running on the main line, he ensured that the engine was turned out to a very high finish. And that helps us look and understand a little bit more about how the thing was operated because these tires on the wheels are beautifully burnished. They're absolutely amazing. They look stunning when you see this engine in operation because they're highly polished. But it reminds us that locomotives have tires as well because steel wheel on steel rail, they wear out both of them at an equal rate and the tires need replacing every so often. So what you have here, and you can see a locating there where the, the, the tire is fitted, what happens is that these tires can be replaced on the wheel casting. And that's usually done with a very large gas ring. You heat up the tire, it expands, comes off, lower the wheel set into the gas ring, and then let it cool down and the tire shrinks onto the wheels. And there is our pony truck that we talked about underneath the cab and the firebox. This enormous great wide firebox enabling the engine to produce steam so effectively and efficiently as possible. And uh, you, know, you can see that the firebox extends to the full width, in fact, over the width of the frames of the locomotive itself. And you can see it tapering in to the side of the boiler barrel up there. And here on the cab side, the proud brass builder's plate, London and North Eastern Railway number 1837, built here in Doncaster in 1936. But of course, no curator with a camera would be complete without a look into the cab and seeing what makes the engine go. So let's go and have a look. With the standardisation of locomotive designs, the footplate of Green Arrow inside the cab here is very, very similar to both Flying Scotsman and Mallard, and that's no mistake. Whilst some of the mechanical details of the locomotive are different, like the boiler is shorter, the wheels are smaller, all of these controls will be very familiar to anybody who knows how to drive an A3 or an A4 Pacific. So, in the driving position of the V2, we have uh, a bucket seat, very similar to, uh, to the A3 and the A4, uh, padded and, and, and leather covered, not quite as, uh, as, as ergonomic as, as, as that on Mallard, but uh, still, you know, a driving position. You're not standing up exposed to all weathers. You've got a window that you can slide closed whilst you've still got not too bad a forward view from the driving position, but you know, slight mod cons where all the controls fall to hand. So there is the regulator as we would expect, and then the reversing gear here, uh, which is rotated uh, using the handle at the top, but has a catch here so you can set it where it wants to be. Uh, so whether you're going for maximum power or maximum efficiency and economy, whether it's accelerating up a hill or coasting, you can set the valves at the front end to where they need to be to allow the engine to do what it wants. Now, of course, the other end of the spectrum, once we've got it up to speed, uh, if we're coming to a station or we need to reduce speed for uh, a curves or a speed restriction, then there's the rather large combined the vacuum brake gear and ejector there, which not only com uh, controls the brake on the locomotive, but controls the vacuum brakes along the train itself. Uh, we looked outside at the sand boxes and, and the sand pipes going down. Those are controlled here. And there is sand, sign written quite helpfully. Uh, sanders open and shut. And then uh, up on top of the, the firebox, the overall pressure gauge there with the red line set for what the loco is to uh, let off steam at there. And um, the engine had its boiler pressure reduced laterally under our operation in 2008 to finish its period in, in steam. And that's combined with our water gauges, uh, one on each side. Uh, you can see the boiler here is empty, 
because the refraction of the light with that reflector behind shows the stripes at diagonal. Um, if there is water in those glasses, you will see the level of water because the, uh, the, the stripes assume a different angle. And then on the back head, the steam controls for the injectors, one on either side, the methods of getting water into the boiler, and above us, the three gauges there, one for the, uh, the speed, and you'll see that it goes up to 100. It says it, it it's, it's, will need recalibrating if we get it going again, because you can see it's stuck at about 12 miles an hour there. Uh, the steam chest pressure gauge, that helps the driver to see, to know what's happening actually in the front end in what they call the steam circuit. There is our whistle valve. Again, watch the Flying Scotsman for uh, curator with a camera film for a graphic depiction of what happens when you pull that. There's no steam today, so it's mercifully silent. And then down to uh, the automatic uh, warning system, train protection and warning system box there, which is one of the, the modern or the more modern signaling um, accoutrements to enable the engine to operate on the main line. It's got some of its gubbins missing, but uh, there would normally be a black and yellow, what we call a sunflower on the ra railway there. Turning to the fireman's side, he also has a seat. Not that he'd be doing a huge amount of sitting down, but when the fireman isn't feeding the fire, one of his duties is to make sure that he's helping the driver keep a good lookout from, uh, for signals and obstructions on the line from his forward facing window. Uh, but he does have a really important device. Uh, he can help the driver with the cylinder drain cocks that we talked about. He can operate those from, from this side of the engine. But it's really important to keep a clean footplate. Coal is dusty, it's dirty, it blows around at speed on a cab like this. So it's really helpful to have a steam lance. And there is the valve connected to a rubber hose. And purely and simply, if the fireman needs to, he will turn that, pipe, that, uh, that valve and you can blast the cab floor, the footplate, clean of any coal dust and muck so that you've got a clean working environment. There's our firebox. It's hiding behind a couple of um, shields and deflectors because it's very, very hot. And into the firebox itself with that very wide grate that we talked about with that ability to steam so freely on Yorkshire coal. There's what's called the brick arch just at the top um, to aid combustion and make sure that uh, you don't have any shocks onto the tube plate. And then outside to what's commonly known and famously known as, as the firebox flap, the Gresley flap. So you fired the engine through the flap. This door will actually swing open and allow you to get in to the fire, to clean the fire with what are called fire irons, big pokers and things like that to sort out clinker and ash and other bits. So turning from the firebox itself, where does the fuel come from? Let's have a look at the tender itself from the cab. It's not at all a large tender like uh, on the Pacific Locos, but it's big enough. Um, there's two lockers, toolboxes at the back here, and there is the coal space in the back of the engine. Several tons of coal there, drip dropped into the loco from on height from a coaling tower or coaling stage and uh, should be enough to last you for the journey that the engine needed to be taken to and at the end of its journey taken off to a locomotive shed where the fuel supplies are replenished. Final bits that we have are um, the handbrake, the parking brake as it were, so this is not used to stop or slow down the engine. It's used to park it at the end of the day. And uh, then what are called the fire irons along stowed on the, that rack. And there again is our concession to modern safety. The, when we ran this on the main line, you can see that there's a padlock and a clamp over it because again, taking the fire irons off the tender underneath electrified wires, very, very much a no-no. So a real, interesting depiction of how we compromise uh, the historic nature of the loco with the requirements of running the modern railway and there just to put a seal on that is the, is a speaker uh, for, for the, uh, the one of the, uh, the warning systems that the engine was fitted in its latter period of use and so from the 21st century back right down to where it is, comes from where it all ha happens and here are 
couple of pieces of that famous Yorkshire coal, which was burnt in the wide firebox here. You need that wide firebox to give you the, the, the greatest um, steaming rate that you can get from this coal. And so really quite nice that there's a very basic link between raw material and the machine doing the job. The Green Arrow and the Gresley V2s lasted in service for the best part of 30 years. Locomotives that could almost do anything, not quite go anywhere, but really, really useful machines. Superb pieces of engineering and testimony to their drivers and firemen and the designer, Sir Nigel Gresley. Thank you for joining us for today's Curator with a Camera where we've looked at Gresley's V2 Green Arrow. If you've enjoyed it, why not like and subscribe so you don't miss out on future episodes, or you may even wish to support the work of the museum by acquiring for yourself one of these locomotion models, double O gauge versions of the V2.